Hey, welcome to Tent Talk, the Farmer's Market Podcast. This is a show all about farmer's markets. Whether you're a farmer's market manager, a farmer, or a food producer selling at farmer's markets, or just a curious farmer's market shopper, this is the podcast for you. Our guest this week is Sarah Delavan, food cost and strategic sourcing consultant. Sarah works with the food makers, farmer's market vendors, restaurants, caterers, and retail markets throughout the U.S. to help them become and remain financially sustainable. On today's episode, Sarah shares tips on sourcing ingredients, keys to understanding your food financials, and mistakes food-driven businesses can avoid making. Hi, I'm one of your hosts, Bridget Myers. I've spent years as an on-site farmer's market manager, and I've done it all from pulling permits to vetting vendors. And I'm your other host, Justine Marzoni-Mead, farmer's market vendor, hot sauce maker, and event facilitator for the Intense Conference. And I'm Cat Fields White, director of San Diego Markets, still an active farmer's market manager and writer, and founder of Intense Business. Welcome back to Tent Talk. This week, we are joined by food cost and strategic sourcing consultant, Sarah Delavan. Sarah's career in food started as a volunteer for the Model Neighborhood Program, Farmer's Market, in 2010. She went on to manage several of their markets until 2012, when she co-founded The Produce Project, a pop-up market and delivery service that brought the best California produce, sustainable meat, dairy, grains, and artisan-made goods to hundreds of individuals and families across greater Los Angeles each week. Her relationships and the quality of the products she sourced led her to joining Heirloom LA as their food sourcing manager in 2014. And in 2017, Sarah founded Sarah Devland Consulting as a means for helping food-driven businesses achieve their financial goals through effective food cost and sourcing strategies. We are so excited to have Sarah join us at the 2019 Intense Conference in February. Hello. Hey, Sarah. It's Justine and Kat and Bridget. Hi. Nice to hear from you guys. Hello there. (laughs) Oh, my Siri went off. Sorry. (laughs) Siri was butting in. (laughs) Okay. So just to get started, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved with food in general? And did you start in um, kind of produce and marketing and things or were you in restaurant or? So my, I had no background in food coming out of college and for the first nine years of my career. Um, I have a, a business degree and went to uh, get a master's. And as I think it's the case for a lot of people in the food industry, there's a personal story or something that went on personally that like pushes you into the industry. And for me, it was suffering with terrible acne for a really long time and taking every pharmaceutical drug that was prescribed to me, putting everything on my face that I could find that I thought might help and nothing worked. And when I moved to LA in 2008, I met a really great dermatologist who really looked at me for the first time and started asking me questions about like, what are you eating and what is your diet like? And when I told her, she said, well, you're subscribing to what society is telling you is going to make you a thin, pretty woman, but you're destroying your insides and it's what's causing this painful acne on your face. So we literally removed processed foods, soy and sugar from my diet and not like all sugar, but you know, in processed foods primarily. And my skin cleared up virtually on its own after that. Wow. Like, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And so it just so happened that I was also reading Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> the combination of those two things. It was just like, how can I not support this industry, particularly with local farmers and, you know, um, organic sustainable ranchers. And I just felt compelled to, to join, um, and to be a part of it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. yeah. So then what was your first step in? Was it the model neighborhood program? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I realized that with my background and zero experience in food, I was probably going to have to volunteer, um, to get a foot in the door in the industry. So I sent emails to every market in LA and probably because there was nothing on my resume that said she's willing to get dirty <laughs> right. and like and leave, no one responded to me. So, yeah, I understand uh, that. We, we get emails from people that say, I'm a dental technician and I need to do something happier. Can I volunteer at the market? And we're like, how, what, what, which of those skill sets might be helpful? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> but what I was able to do was the Model Neighborhood Program is um, it's a nonprofit neighborhood improvement organization. And so they were really focused on being able to um, support folks who use WIC, um, EBT and SNAP. Um, the Senior Farmers Market Nutrition Program um, and Farm to School Programs. And at the time, they needed someone to come in and do market research and help them develop a newsletter to talk to their clientele. And I thought, well, uh, that's in my wheelhouse. Um, I don't know how much to charge for something like that, but maybe if I offer to do it for free, they'll let me. (laughs) And they did. (laughs) So I did that project for them. Um, and obviously got to know the market managers, um, and the woman who was running it at the time and then stepped into managing. I think I managed two or three markets for them, um, at different locations. And I did that for several months. Um, I loved it. And were those markets financially sustainable markets? Were they self-supporting or were they subsidized more of a social service kind of model? I know that they were nonprofit, but I, I don't have the information to fully answer your question. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Um, and are they still operating? I think the La Cienega market is still going, and that was yeah. a model neighborhood market. Are, do, are the others, do you know? I don't know if the other ones are still going. Gotcha. I believe they are. The The other two that were happening while I was there were at Kaiser Permanente campuses. Right. They were teeny, um, right? They're very teeny. Some of those Kaiser yeah. markets just have like seven or eight vendors. There, yeah, I think the one that I managed had maybe 10 or 12, and then there was a much bigger one in Long Beach. Um, oh, gotcha. That, um, that I also that I also helped out with. That's great. And then at some point you segued into the produce project, which is a really interesting project. Um, (laughs) I'm a little curious about that. Just coming from a farmer's market management background, how did that fit between direct marketing laws and standard pack laws? Um, you know, you obviously were not selling standard pack produce, uh, but if you were reselling, you weren't fitting into the direct marketing laws. And I, uh, by the way, we're wondering why you were careful not to use the term farmers markets or CSA Mm -hmm. in that project. And, uh, thank you very much. (laughs) We we really try to protect those terms. (laughs) So obviously you knew enough about it that you didn't want to impinge on those terms. So where, how did you do that legally? So we, so first thing I want to say is that the produce project came out of what I saw while at the model neighborhood program. And that was literally everyone from every demographic, every income level at all of these various markets, because the clientele was very different. They all had the same reaction to the food and they were all so excited and so connected to it. And it was like, I need to do something that gets this experience to more people in the community. And I also wanted to support farmers in extending their reach outside of the farmer's market, because a lot of markets are happening at, you know, three in the afternoon on a Thursday or 11 in the morning on a Wednesday. And there's a huge part of the population that can't get there and do that, you know, do their shopping there. So initially we wanted to open a store and went through a long leasing process and decided to not move forward with that lease. And we were having coffee talking about, cause I, I founded it with another woman And we were talking about, well, what's our next move? We've spent six months planning for this and now what? And the owners of the coffee shop were like, well, you could do a pop-up and you could do it here. And we thought, "Ah, maybe this is not the market that we were trying to serve. It was a wealthy community in downtown Los Angeles. But we thought, well, we'd still be achieving 50% of our goal of extending the reach of the farmers and artisans. So we talked about it and we looked into all of the coding and, and, you know, what needed to be, um, in place in order to sell food inside the cafe. And so because we didn't break any of those rules, we were allowed to be sort of like a part of their, you know, business. And we were, not a farmer's market. And we, and we knew that, and we weren't willing to call ourselves that. And we also didn't want to call ourselves a CSA because again, we're not farmers and we weren't trying to, you know, be that. So we started as a pop-up and then started making these meal kits for people. 
beautiful produce. They were gorgeous baskets. They took a ton of time to make. Um, they each had three recipes in them. Um, and those started to take off. And so then we were delivering at the time the produce project ended in 2014, we were delivering produce and meat and artisan made goods from like, uh, Santa Monica to Pasadena. And oh, then wow. it was like a really big swath of, of the community. So, and did that make sense for you financially? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> labor intensive. <laughs> Very labor intensive. And, you know, I think now it's been several years after the fact. Um, I can look back and say that what I'm doing now as a consultant, I wish someone had done for us when we were running that business. Because Something I've discovered and something that I see in other business owners is that you feel like you're doing something good. You're trying to do something good. You're trying to make a difference in the world and to feel like you could also make money at doing that is a little shameful. It feels a little dirty. Um, but the alternative is that then your business doesn't exist. Right. And yeah. you, can't, you can't do these good things that you're trying to do. And we weren't able to see that back then. Um, and we couldn't figure out, you know, how at these prices that we felt were appropriate, um, could we continue and, and we couldn't. So that's so funny. Cause that's exactly, I mean, that's our whole spiel at intense is passion meet profit and yeah. convincing people that it's okay to make money doing what you want to do. And mm -hmm. if you won't do that favor for yourself, make sure you're profitable, then do it for these people that you think you're doing good things for because you can't keep doing it for them if you don't make enough money to keep yourself alive. So yeah, that's, exactly. that's all just so critical. So did yep. you kind of segue from Produce Project into more of the consulting world? No, I went right from the Produce Project to working for a company called Heirloom LA, which was a premier catering company here in Los Angeles. They still are in business. Um, and they brought me on as their food sourcing manager. So it was my job to order all the food that came through the company. Um, they wanted it to be local, sustainable, or certified organic, um, and to develop relationships with these, with these folks. So they were trying to really set the standard for this type of food in the catering world. Um, and it was during my time there that I started to identify, despite them being an amazing company that produced amazing food and was profitable, they were making missteps um, I'll give you an example we used to sell this taco buffet. It was our highest selling item. We lost money every time we sold it mm. and had no idea because nobody did any recipe costing. Gotcha. It was again, the idea of like, I think the appropriate price to pay for this buffet is such and such amount of money. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and not so, taking into account what it costs to produce. Exactly. Yeah. And, I, and the way my mind works, I think with my sort of analytical background and my education was like, when I started taking over the buying, I wanted to know, okay, if we're selling this dish for $12, um, how much am I allowed to spend on food? And we didn't really have an answer for that. And so I was not That's satisfied sad. with that. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I started digging in. And so I discovered things like that. I discovered that, you know, we bought from two different vendors, um, wholesale vendors and cauliflower from one was like $3 a case or $10 a case more expensive than the other. And I was like, well, if we don't know why we're buying what and from whom and what the prices are, we're killing our food cost percentage, like, and changing it day by day. So I just really took the reins and worked with the owner on, on getting control of all of that and kind of figuring it all out. And then when I left heirloom and I joined, uh, you know, and worked with a few other companies, they all had the same problems. And I thought, well, if I do this as a consultant, I can help a lot more people than if I'm an employee of one company. And that's where the consulting idea came from. Now, consultants are typically not much better than food people at making sure that they cover their costs and make money. So <laughs> how'd you do uh, as your own client? Did you <laughs> make sure that you were getting paid for your time and the time you spent recruiting not in clients the beginning. And, what, not in the beginning. <laughs> not in the beginning. My <laughs> first client as a consultant, this is, I'm not going to name the person, but they're a Michelin starred chef. And I literally charged her $25 an hour. 
for mm. my, <laughs> but for matching her up with, with farms and stuff. But it was because I was eager to get sure. started. Yeah. Um, and I have very lovely people in my life who are like, um, you can't go on <laughs> doing that forever. <laughs> so I started talking with other consultants and, and really sat with what do I need to charge to, to be successful at this financially and to do it as a living. And, um, came up with a price that I feel comfortable with now. Good. And, That's great. and yeah, so I got there, but it's like, because months. we want you to stay in business too, because it's yeah. the more I hear, the more it sounds like this is a, a perfect thing to refer our clients to and our um, farmer's market vendors and our artisan food makers that are getting off the ground. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you. So in addition to chefs, who else are your, uh, your primary clients? So primarily I'm working with retail brands and caterers. They're like my top two um, types of businesses I work with. And then on the restaurant side, I do a lot of like strategic sourcing and matching, um, of the restaurant with say a farm. Um, but, um, I don't work with restaurants a whole ton. Okay. Could you just give us like, for me, I know that this is one area that I need to do a better job of. Like we didn't c- include labor in our price until like recently when we moved to a co-packer and I was like, huh, why didn't we, why don't we have as much retained earnings this year? And I was like, oh yeah, I should have to pay for labor. Um, <laughs> Which you but, should have been doing all along to yeah, yourself. I know. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. But I didn't. <laughs> You're um, not alone. <laughs> I know. Um, so could you just give us like a little, like just thumbnail sketch of like what a food cost analysis in like how you do it and why it's really important for small, small food driven businesses to do. Of course. So the food costing analysis is a very simple look at your three cost categories, operational, labor, and food, as well as your revenue. Um, and it allows you to see how all of those things affect your profits. So for example, if you've got you know, 30% food, 30% labor, and 30% operational costs, you've got 10% left over to fall into your profit bucket. Oftentimes, something in there is too high or out of whack. And when I lay it out for folks in this really simple format, they can see, oh, you know, my food costs are at 40% and it's leaving me nothing. And that's why I'm struggling to operate um, week by week. And so once we identify, you know, okay, this is not as much profit as I want to make, there's a second formula that I do that looks at what is your profit goal and in order to reach that, what is the target food cost that you need to hit to be there? And so once we sort of do step one and step two, we have our target food cost, and then we can start making a plan of action to get there. Great. Yeah, that was kind of my next question is what you thought about profit first mentality in terms of food costs. And we were talking to a farmer a couple of weeks ago and he was saying the way he prices is he starts by figuring out how much he wants to make and then works backward f- from there. Yeah. It's funny because I had never heard of this profit first mentality and I had to Google it. And after I read about it a little bit, I was like, oh yeah, totally. Like <laughs> you, you need to pay yourself, right? Like I, I don't think it makes sense to have a goal of like, it's fine if we don't make any money the first year. I hear a lot of food businesses say, well, just as soon as I scale, I'll start making money. But it's like, if you're not making money where you're at now, you're just going to probably make less money when <laughs> <Yeah. you scale. laughs> or not be able to scale because it takes money to scale. So you need to be you paying yourself profit, yeah, in order to increase. Yeah. It's a step by step. Exactly. And I think it's the, for me, it's proven efficient and effective to, illustrate things for business owners this way. And once they see, you know, I have one client who, you know, a three percentage point change, could decrease in her food costs was $17,000 in savings for her. And when small businesses see numbers like that, it's like, Oh, okay. What do I need to do to get that down? Like I'm on board. Yeah. You know, like, okay. This is important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Do you see any patterns in like specific areas where food makers leave something out of the formula? I mean, besides forgetting to pay themselves for labor, (laughs) I know that's what my thing is, but do you see like certain things come up again and again? Not in the formula itself, but in terms of 
food spending and food budgeting, there are common missteps and mistakes that businesses are making. One of the biggest ones is that people don't know what they're paying for ingredients until after they've been purchased. And I equate that to like going to the grocery store and like loading up your cart, but you have a finite amount of money. And when you get to the register, like you can't, you can't take it all. You can't have it all. You can't overspend, you know, but in your business, you're attempting to do that and it's eating into your profits. Um, so I've developed a tool, which I used to call the the custom order guide, but my friends and clients have convinced me to change it to the ultimate ordering and budgeting tool, Ooh, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> which I'm kind of digging right now. Um, But basically that came out of my work as a buyer. I needed to know how much do these ingredients cost? And I want to compare them between vendors to make sure I'm making the smartest decision possible. And then the other mistake people make is they don't have a system for how much do they need to produce and, and how much do they need to have in terms of ingredients to produce that product. And when they fall short somewhere, they run out to the grocery store or to, you know, somewhere. And it's just literally twice as expensive to purchase, you know, from that type of, of vendor. And so that's really hurting, um, your profits and really driving up your food costs. So, I would say to sum it up, it's a, it's simply a lack of information, um, and sort of doing your homework beforehand so that you can make really informed decisions. Amazing. So can you tell us a little bit about how you help chefs and some of your catering companies connect with farmers? I think that's something that a lot of farmers at the farmer's market would love to do, but there's kind of like, I don't know, there seems to be like a separation there or certain farmers maybe not, might not know how to get into that. Um, do you have any tips for small food producers that are looking to make relationships with chefs or caterers and how to make that happen? Yeah. Um, I think that I would not recommend popping by their business. (laughs) (laughs) Don't do that. Um, but a couple of things, I mean, it's in this day and age, like if you have an Instagram account, follow them, um, start to develop a connection with them, um, and see what their needs are so that when you approach them, there's you've got a value that you can provide. Um, you're not just someone who's reaching out for the first time, um, with no knowledge of, of the business. Um, the other thing is, so this is for both producers and for farmers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I would say for producers who want to use farmers market goods, it's to visit your market. And if you've got chefs that are coming through the market, reach out to them and ask them, what do they need from you um, in order to work together? A lot of times it's like, well, I need an availability list and, you know, just giving them information such as what's your wholesale pricing? What's your um, wholesale case sizes? um, How often do you deliver? um, What do, what do you as the company who might be purchasing from me need from me in order to make this really easy for you? The number one roadblock that I hear from businesses who want to buy local is that it's just so hard. Mm -hmm. Just the logistics. Yeah. Like it's too much legwork involved. Um, and I don't think there has to be, I find it to be very simple if you know what questions to ask. So Kat and I teach a monthly, um, vendor class, vendor 101, and we teach Mm -hmm. people who want to start farmer's market businesses in San Diego. So we go through the San Diego permitting process and all of that. And we get Mm -hmm. a lot of questions about how do I know what my food cost is? Um, how, how much do I bring on the first day? That kind of thing. And then people also say like, I'm afraid of numbers. Like I'm not good at math. Like how am I, what do I do? Like, what would you tell somebody who has a really great recipe is a really good people person is organized and can run a business, but is not very confident with the number crunching. Like what can, how can we get them there? I would say, call me. Or, or, um, because I work with a lot of people that say that exact thing, I've developed tools that are sort of dummy proof. So I have, for example, a recipe costing template where everything is built in and all you have to do is type the ingredient name, the amount and the cost for that unit. So let's say you even are doing like, um, let's say there's almonds in your recipe and it's a half a cup of almonds. We just need to know what it costs for one cup 
of almonds and it will translate that cost for you. And then it gives you the cost per yield. Um, and then if you want to break that down into like cost per portion, it's all there for you too. And if you know that your target food cost percentage, for example, is 30%, there's a box for that. And then it pops out, um, your suggested retail price. So it's like finding people or tools that sort of take all the scary stuff out of your hands and kind of simplify it for you yeah. um, to get you the information that you need. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like people are like, what do I do? How much do I bring? And we're like, well, it's really specific to your <laughs> specific recipe. So you really need to have someone kind of help you through that. If you can't figure yeah. it out on your own, you really need to break it down. You know, you mm-hmm. need to incorporate packaging. You need to incorporate mm-hmm. your time. <laughs> your labels. Do you find people too yeah. are um, confused by the yield of the food that they buy? So We've got somebody making pies, for instance. I mean, Mm -hmm. I think she's counting the cost per pound of apples. I'm not sure she's dealing with the fact that when you cut an apple, you're losing some of that. You're losing the core and you're Mm -hmm. losing the top and bottom. And so the per pound price of apples is not translating exactly. Do you work through with people a way to kind of fix that in the formulas? Yes, I do. Um, And it takes a little bit of education. Um, Sort of what she's doing is like the cheater way of <laughs> recipe costing, um, but it's it's a, a, some it's the way that even really high level professionals do it. Um, a lot of people food cost based on like, well, I'm just going to do the protein, um, and again, it's not even based on yield. It's just like, well, I'm buying this much protein, and so then I'm going to mark it up by you know times two point five or times four or what have you, and they're not really doing all of the work, and they're setting them, themselves up for failure. We, uh, we had a client a long time ago that would he gave us a recipe that was food costed, but he had done something similar to that, and he just didn't have any of the other stuff in the recipe, and he said, "What does it matter? Eggs cost a nickel." <laughs> and that's been kind of a running joke for us like, since then when we talk to vendors. No. It's like, well, you know, eggs only cost a nickel. <laughs> See, people don't include salt and pepper. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah, that has a cost. Yeah. And you're buying it, right? lot If you're making a thousand of something, yeah. you know what I mean? So like I, and this might be the Virgo in me, which, which I love that about me. Like I'm going to get every little detail in there and, and we're going to know for sure what your recipe is costs. Um, I don't believe in picking your price out of thin air. And I think partial recipe costing is basically the same thing. Um, you're not setting yourself up for success. It just makes me so nervous, um, to hear people doing that. And let's be honest, like when I'm recipe costing for people, I will take a cup of almonds and put it on the scale and see what it weighs in ounces, you know, to be sure. Um, if someone's converting a teaspoon of salt into ounces, I'm, I'm weighing that, you know, if I, if I don't have it in my database, because I want it to be really accurate and specific. And if you grow to the point where you're scaling, um, and someone else is doing the ingredient purchasing and production for you, you want it to be really exact because you want your costs and your profits and your margins to all line up with what you believe they're going to be. No surprises. Yeah, exactly. I don't feel like small businesses, any kind of small business can like take that chance on that kind of surprise. So why wouldn't you just track everything from the get go? And then we have our farmer's market vendors. Sometimes they build their business and then they turn around and maybe they want to sell their business or they want to get a partner or an investor. And I feel like if you don't have those numbers all crunched out and if someone says, who's wanting to buy your business, why do you charge this much for your pie? And you can't fully explain it. Like if I were an investor in a business or wanted to buy a business, that's not something I would buy because I'd want that work to be done. And I want to know that that person was really knowledgeable about that. Yeah. And and this, oh, sorry. This is so important too. When like, when you're selling direct to consumer, you're kind of like, okay, well, people are buying it for this much and you know, I'm making some profit. But then when you start selling wholesale, you, a lot of people, that's when a lot of small businesses really start to lose money because they they don't know how much their product costs. Yeah. Like they're just, they're right. not retaining as much. Yeah. As you so when you say, I'm going to sell this to you for 60% of retail and you don't know what your product yeah. costs, you may have just started taking a loss on every unit. Yeah. 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 Which I want to point out that on average, my clients have three products or menu items that are losing money every time they're sold. I believe so that. Yeah. Oh. Mm-hmm. You mean it's when they not, start with you, presumably. Not exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
but it's, you know, and it's often, um, can be remedied. And in some cases it's that, you know, you can't produce this beautiful thing that you're making at a price that your clientele can buy. And so you eliminate it from your product line or from your menu. So, you know, sometimes there's that hard decision to make, but usually there are modifications, um, or just a simple price change that the the market is willing to accept. Yeah, um, I was going to ask, I, I feel like there's also like this breaking point where you have to figure out like, am I going to, one, stop making this completely, two, increase the price, or three, compromise the quality of the sourcing mm-hmm. of the ingredients? And like where, you know, you as a consultant and somebody who like loves food from a good that, it's sort of from a yeah. good place. Like, how do you make those decisions? How do you guide your um, clients through those moments? Yeah. So step one is going to be, let's look at other vendors who can sell me the same products and see if I can't get the same quality at a better price. Um, wholesale, you know, vendors, if their volume is higher. If vendor A's volume is higher than vendor B, their prices are going to be a bit lower. So first let's do our homework and see what else is out there. Um, an example from the taco buffet was we were using an organic creme fraiche, um, and it was super expensive and we didn't want to, um, hurt the integrity of the dish or reduce the quality of the ingredients we were putting in there. We just substituted the creme fraiche with a really high quality organic sour cream that was a quarter of the price. Um, and the taste at the outcome was the same. Um, so, you know, looking at other vendors, looking at ingredient substitutions where the quality is the same, but the price might be a little bit lower is an option. Um, and then in some cases it's like, well, can you make this recipe without, this ingredient. And why don't we, why don't we play around with it and see what the outcome is? Um, and usually more often than not, it's, you find a solution. We had a a vegan ice cream maker a long time ago at one of the markets and she was like costing herself out of business. Her prices were way too low. She was young. She just got kind of into it, but I, she had, it was like a fig ice cream and then figs went out of season. She was buying them from local farmers and getting really good deals. And then figs went out of season. So then she was paying, she was going to like the grocery store and getting figs and putting them in there. And we're like, no, we're like either get a way better wholesale price, go to a wholesaler that can sell you figs at a better price or yeah. change your flavors of ice cream and say it's seasonal because you have yeah. relationships with farmers, change it to strawberry ice cream, like change the, it to a seasonal thing. So it's things that they aren't thinking about. And I feel like some small businesses get really stuck in like, this is what my is selling and I don't want to change it yeah. no matter what. And it's really, yeah. that's where they get kind of caught up and can trip up their yeah. business. Yeah. When new businesses are starting and they need to source ingredients and they want to do it from a local vendor, um, or a farmer, there are a few different options that they can, a few different paths they can take to do it. So they can source directly from the farmer's market, or if that's too expensive or takes too much time, they can find local vendors who are working with local farmers. And I get calls a lot from people who are starting new businesses and they're like, I'm overwhelmed at the idea of figuring out where to source my ingredients. And so I have sort of this top three things that you should do when you're reaching out and trying to figure out who to source from. So the first one is know your ingredient standards. So if you want it to be all local ingredients or if you want them to be certified organic or you want them to be biodynamic, write that down and be super clear on that with yourself first. Then get an idea of what your volume is. So how much are you going to be buying in a particular week um, or month? And then know what your needs are. So how many times a week are you going to need delivery? Um, Is there a certain window of time that you need these things delivered? You know, if you're making fresh product for a Saturday market, do you need to do that on a Thursday? And do you need your kitchen to be operational by 11 a.m.? Which means your deliveries need to be in by 9 once you jot all of that down, you can reach out to the vendors in your area or talk to your farmers um, and figure out who can meet the needs that you have. So often people get matched up um, only to be let down by product quality not being what they want or delivery windows being outside of of what they need. Um, And it just causes unnecessary frustration um, in your business. So I think 
if you do those three things and you're really clear, um, and you reach out to your potential vendors with that info, um, you'll be setting yourself up for success. Yeah, I think that's really good advice. And there's a fair number of farmers markets. You know, we go out to a lot of people, not just California. Um, and as we talk to more and more farmers market managers, it's becoming a bigger thing that they want their artisan grocery vendors and their prepared food vendors and those folks to be sourcing locally, to be buying mm-hmm. from local farmers or local sources. So I think those tips that finding those kind of vendors and sources is really important. Um, and and it all boils down to what you're saying, that good communication about what it is you need and stand by that. Yeah. I, if you're yeah. going to be a good customer, you deserve to have a vendor that meets your needs. Yeah. And yeah. that that's really helpful advice from like a maker's point of view. Um, because when you're starting small, like I remember the first time Dave and I made a five gallon bucket of sauce. We're like, we're rich. Like <laughs> yeah. it was like the most we'd ever made. And now we're making like a lot more than that. Yeah. Um, but sourcing those peppers weren't that hard. But then when we need a thousand pounds of peppers, like mm-hmm. that was a really, really hard and scary process to find a supplier that could fill that need. And it's also such a seasonal thing. So, so I wish I knew you four years ago. (laughs) Secretly, that's like my favorite thing to hear people say. It like boosts my ego so much. Um, Like, do you have a time machine? (laughs) Yeah, let's go back in time. But it's not too late. You can still keep (laughs) improving in established business. And that's something to remember, too, is people think they have to make all these decisions at the beginning. Even if you've been doing it, we won't say wrong, but not as well as you could. Uh, You can always change your focus and you can change the way you do things and you can make even a successful business way more successful. So totally. you know, yeah. staying open to yeah. those ideas as you grow is important. You can always start. Yeah. Yeah. Incremental change is easy to make and, um, you know, makes a huge difference mm-hmm. to your bottom line. And I think to your life and life enjoyment. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. When we see vendors that have kind of reevaluated their business, gotten better on their food costs. They have a better time at the market. Sure. They really do enjoy their time. We've seen noticeable differences where it's like they can breathe again, like, or they can go do fun stuff. Like you're saying, like they can do pop-ups because they actually know if they have the money to do it or if they have the yeah. time to do it. Yeah. So just that getting organized and having that time just makes you enjoy your amazing creative business. Well, you don't resent being there. Yeah. Working that hard to break even just isn't fun. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I think it probably also affects your sales approach too, when you're not like desperate for every single, you're like, if I don't make this one. Yeah, it really does. It affects so many things. And I think Charlotte said, Charlotte Smith said at the last intense conference, which I always think about, if I wanted to go broke, I could be sitting on the beach in Hawaii going broke, and that would be fun. <laughs> I'm not going to go broke working this hard, yeah. being so yeah. stressed out, ruining all my relationships. She's like, so if I'm going to work this hard, which I want to do, I don't want to go broke doing it. I want yeah. it to be profitable so I can enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. totally. Yeah. And I think you, you make an important point. Um, as small business owners, it's so easy to get caught up. And when you're running the day to day and you're often stressed and your to-do list is huge, you, the, the ability to be creative in some ways is, is hampered a bit. Um, that sort of creative and even strategic thinking sometimes is like hard to do. Um, and I find that when you put systems in place, right. And you get organized and you have, tools that kind of do the work for you, it opens up that capacity to sort of be creative and, and get strategic again. And I think that that's a, another important role that I play with, with clients is just freeing them up a bit. Cause once you get to that point where you're kind of making some money, but then some kind of hiccup comes along, if you're just finally to that point, it's like, you just want to stay in that course because it's been working for you. And that really shuts down all those things that you started out with, which usually, especially food makers are very creative people and have a lot of great ideas, but they get bogged down by the business of it all. Mm -hmm. So it's great to just start out. I try to like really drive that home in our classes because they're all great food makers, but it's like, you also need to have this business like baseline in place or else it's at some point you're going to get caught up in it and your business is going to go sideways. So just well, the other prepared. thing is, like we were talking earlier, just valuing your work and your ingredients and what you're producing. Mm-hmm. We often find people that are 
terribly underpricing their products. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody says to me, oh, I'm selling out two hours before the market closes, I need to make more. My first reaction is, no, no, you don't. You need to raise your price. (laughs) Keep raising your price until you're not selling out and then think about making more. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Exactly. So many strategies. Yeah. Um, well, I'm really excited that you're coming to Intense because yeah. I feel like this is really valuable and this is what our Tent Talk listeners definitely come here to listen to is like hard advice and like hard, not hard, but like real advice that they can take to their businesses and make work for them since we're working on passion and profit. Yes. Save me a seat in your workshop. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> Justine can need, needs to pay herself. Yeah. Um, but we are going to do a little wrap up question here since we're at the end of our chat today. Um, sure. And since we're kind of approaching the new year shortly, I can't believe it. Um, just thinking about our businesses that we do. So Justine's a vendor and Kat and I uh, run markets and the education program. So what's a financial goal you think food driven business owners should set for 2019? So that's something, maybe like a, I know there's probably 40 goals you have for people and all, we also have ourselves. And that's overwhelming. So yes. I'll take one at a time. One yeah. at a time. Yeah. So what's one important one you want to say? Well, I hope this isn't like sort of a cop out in terms of an answer, but, um, I think becoming informed about your financials. So even if, so understand how much your item costs to make. Mm-hmm. I think is number one. If there's nothing else you're going to do in terms of financials, that needs to be the number one thing. Because without that knowledge, you can't make informed decisions about price, um, both on the retail end and the wholesale end. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's key. Mm-hmm. Choices and options. Yeah. Justine, yeah. what do you think is one goal? can give yourself besides paying yourself (laughs) (laughs) I think also um like for us we really need to like make a better budget just so we know like hey can we afford to do some like marketing or can we you know I don't know do a special event or can you know finding just knowing how much that we can spend and so we can invest that in other ways in addition to pain ourselves. But it's kind of the same thing. It's just like informing yourself and making a plan. We mm-hmm. kind of by nature are just like fly by the seat of our pants, fly, fly by the <laughs> seat of our pants. And because we're such a small company, we can kind of like, there's just two of us. We could be like, Hey, you want to do this? Yeah, let's do it. But <laughs> making a better plan, um, in the new year is always a good time to do that. <laughs> yeah, it's a good time to re- reevaluate. Kat, what's a, something you can do better financially? I think what we're going to do this year, and I, I remind other people to do it and then I forget to do it, is uh, to rebid all of our services this year. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of times we'll get bids for, I mean, I'm a farmer's market manager, so I'm getting bids for things like supplying rented toilets <laughs> and uh, insurance and phone services, for that matter, for the office. And a lot of times a new vendor will come in and they'll get your business by giving you a really low bid and then it'll creep up with little tiny increases Mm -hmm. and then you realize three years later if you're not paying attention that you're paying more than you paid before you switched vendors so I think um, those basic services and things need to be rebid you need to look around and see is there a new company that's hungry for business and is you know will do the a better job for you on this when you realize those little things where you can like yeah. oh yeah i can change my menu so i'm not play, paying figs like uh, grocery store prices for figs just little things that you don't realize it's like surprise you like right oh yeah. you can get a barricade at a better price or something right. you know? and especially yeah. if it's something that you're paying for weekly or monthly mm-hmm. i think it's a really good thing to think of that in terms of annual expense. You yeah. know, we give our vendors a, a small discount. It's not a huge discount, um, but it's a discount for paying monthly instead of paying weekly. Mm-hmm. And they'll yeah. say, oh, well, it's only $5. Or it's only $10. I'll say, you know, that's 500 bucks a year. Mm-hmm. You want to think about that again? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 I think just one more note on, on knowing what your, what your item costs to make when you're a young business. And I'm sure you, maybe you get this often. It's like people are asking for, well, if I buy a lot, can I have a discount or mm-hmm. can I have some free product, you know, in exchange for some promotion? And that can become troublesome if you do it too often, or you yeah. don't know how much wiggle room you have to offer a discount to someone. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I hate to see young businesses run into, 
you know, losses because they they think they're making a good decision um, for the promotion of their of yeah, their business. Yeah, so often, but you know, give this to me for free, and then I'll spread the word about your product. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> we have new vendors start at the market that are just like, oh, they're so excited to be there, and I'll come try to buy their product, and they're like, oh, just take one. And it's, I have to tell them like, yes, that'd be great for me. Like my family <laughs> grocery budget would love that, but yeah. I'm here to buy your product. Like maybe if you, if you figured it out in the back end, you can give me like a small discount once we like get to know each other and you're getting your businesses up and running. Yeah. But on the first few weeks, I'm, I always say like, just charge me full price. Please don't give your product Please away. Please don't give it to me. And then I, because also I'm like, I don't want to even shop from you because it makes me feel uncomfortable because I know that you just started your business. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I don't want to take all your free stuff. I don't know if you guys offer like a list of recommended like reading or anything to your vendors. This book has this, a pretty silly name, um, but it's called You're a Badass at Making Money. Oh, and, yeah. oh I love that book. Yeah, that. Okay, <laughs> so you know, and I just, just talk so much about the energy exchange that is the exchange of money and sort of respecting yourself and the person that you're giving your product to enough to charge. Yeah. And yeah. you know what I mean? And to be happy to do it. It's like, I have so many friends now that are in different industries and we can all help one another. And we now have committed to charging one another full price mm-hmm. okay. because, because we believe that like you're, we're each worth it. You know, we don't want to discount services and products for one another and it's better for all of us in the long run. So um, oh, I think all farmers market vendors need to do that too. Yeah, yeah awesome. for sure. Yep. Um, I think mine is just big, focused a lot on efficiency because it kind of goes along with paying myself. It's I've kind of noticed that there's a lot of like little email traps that I get into where I'm answering people's questions that like they could be Googling or like aren't urgent. And I spend <laughs> so much of my own time kind of getting back to them right away and like getting, fixing their problems where I'm not spending my time doing things like we've been talking about taking our vendor one-on-one course and putting, making eBooks and doing, taking our show on the road and things that are really going to bring revenue into our business. Mm -hmm. Instead, my day is only so many hours and I'm taking time to like put out fires for other people that are not, that should, don't need to be handled right away. So I think my big goal for 2019 is to like make a big financial investment in myself by doing things that are going to have a good ROI and kind of set a time aside to reply back to those emails quickly, but not make it a big deal. not make it a huge part of my labor that I'm doing because I do need to pay myself too. So yeah. Yeah. act, not react, act, not react. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right, Sarah, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time to talk to us. We can't wait to have you at intense 2019. Yeah. So stoked. Thank you so much. I think you're going to be popular. Hope- yeah, for <laughs> yeah. sure. That's going to yeah. be a busy workshop. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting you ladies in person. Yeah, yeah, Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much. You so much. Right. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, have a good one. Talk soon. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for listening along. Please leave us a review on iTunes and tell us how you liked today's episode. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss the next one. And if you want more Farmer's Market tips, you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter at IntenseBusiness.com and follow us on Instagram at IntenseBusiness. That's I-N-T-E-N-T-S Business. Sarah will be leading a workshop at the Intense Conference on taking control of food costs to achieve financial sustainability and growth. The 2019 Intense Conference will be held in San Diego, February 24th through the 26th. Sarah will be there, will you? This podcast is produced by Intense Business, where passion meets profit. Today's episode was recorded and edited by Justine marzoni Mead. Original music by David Mead. Special thanks to our guest, Sarah Delavan and San Diego Markets.